Recording in process, progress. Setting up your meeting for YouTube Live. Redirecting to YouTube. Here comes the echo. Hello, hello. Recording in process, progress. <laughs> okay, that's good. So we are now live on YouTube. That's exciting. And just one more. We're going to click the record function. One moment. Record. Record. Record on this computer. Okay. Hello and welcome, everybody, boys and girls. Welcome back to FractalU.com, FractalField.com. I'm here, Dan Winter, as you know, and our co-host, Tufan Guven, GeometricModels.org, is here with our announcements. Tonight's presentation is a new history of Thoth, Tehuti, Hermes, with all the spiritual implications around alchemy and the history of indigenous tribes and indigenous lucid dreaming and indigenous stories that go with Veracoca Quetzalcoatl stories. So it's actually, I have some of the most complicated lecture notes I've ever had in my life for tonight's conversation. Let's hope I get this together. <laughs> Anywho, uh, but first uh, we're going to have some announcements. Uh, Tufan, would you like to? Sure. Hi everyone. This is Tufan. Um, so first announcement is that Three classes between March 10 and 14th, starting with next week, we have a different time for the Paris time. New York time is still stable with 2 p.m. New York time, but Paris time changes to um, 7, p. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Paris time for three classes only, which are Buddies, Mind, and Vedas presentations. And then we will be we will get back to normal. Um, 8 p.m. again afterwards. But so we are fixing to New York time always, except for our very last two events, which are in May. But we will uh, announce that again when the time comes. And next week we are meeting with Buddy James about the, his beautiful um, Doherty sets and golden scaling. Uh, he has amazing implosion geometrics of Doherty uh, sets, uh, which he will be connecting it with the physics of Dan Winter. So we are excited about that. And um, Dan, do you want to say anything about our new upcoming event? Yes. So, uh, well, first of all, just to say that the time change is only because uh, Europe changes to daylight savings times after the USA. That's why a difference. So we stay with 2 p.m. New York, but because Europe doesn't change till later, that's why it's only five hours difference for the first couple of weeks. So it, it's just because daylight savings time is different on the continents. Okay, so yes, uh, Tufan is right. Our, we're excited because our plan to do a major international conference for the fourth time this year is cooking beautifully for about September 1920. Begin four days in amuse, amazing countryside beauty in France with fun and toys. And, oh my God, it's going to be really cool. And the website is almost ready. We'll be announcing that next week because Tufan is wandering over here to play with us in France for this week, actually. And we're going to be doing our homework for many things. And also uh, the piezofire.com new manual and new audio files, etc. We're going to be getting that together and uh, we're going to be catching up because we're victims of our own success. So many people interested in Piezo Fire that uh, Tufan is coming over here for, so we can get our show together because we're shipping them as fast as we can. So it's all good. All fun. Okay. So now I'm going to remove pin here from Tufan and put the pin back on me. Hopefully I Remember to smile. So tonight's conversation, I noticed the long hair. The long hair is because Valerie said I needed to be a hippie. Uh, no, because uh, we missed the hairdresser's appointment. No, you, <laughs> because they want to call me Papa Noel around here anyway. So that's uh, <clears throat> the physics of long hair. <laughs> no. So tonight's conversation is to put in context the huge and powerful history of Thoth, Hermes, Veracoca, Quetzalcoatl, Ningashida, uh, the reason that the royal line of Egypt exists, Thothmosis, sons of, sons of Thoth, the reason the line of David exists, Tehute, DWT, Tehuti, Thoth, the reason the North Pole is called Thule, the reason the Holy Grail bloodline, the Black Madonna, exists, because that is the children of the royalty of Egypt. 
The reason that the study of alchemy even exists on this planet, the reason for the existence and entire purpose of the entire history of the Templars is Thoth, Atlantis, and the study of alchemy he brought. So the big picture, and I do mean big picture, of the history of Thoth, Hermes, Viracocha, Quetzalcoatl is what we're going to try to assemble tonight. And let me say in, in advance, the picture is so big that I ain't going to be able to do this tonight. But we're going to, I'm not going to finish the story, but we're going to have a lot of fun trying. So first I'm going to give an introduction around what I think is the ancient history of Thoth, Hermes, Hermes Viracocha, Quetzalcoatl. <laughs> And then I'm going to tell a personal story about tribal memory, uh, which I hope introduces why Thoth, under the name Viracocha, Quetzalcoatl, was so focused on the indigenous tribes who obviously had a soul. Mm -hmm. And what did that mean? And why was that so central to the focus on this planet of having the human condition grow up what they call, into what they called Adam Kadmon, or the ensouled condition. So why were the indigenous peoples so important to Thoth at the same time indigenous peoples were consistently murdered throughout history by Western culture? Because somebody knew where there was coherence in ancestor memory, and that was the central theme of their Viracoco Quetzalcoatl, and that will lead to our story tonight. So I do think in terms of the Thoth history, you know, we had been studying the Templars with William Bueller for so many years, and whose only author for almost the entire story was Thoth Hermes, actually. <laughs> and uh, But uh, I have to say, and honor here, Elena Danan, I believe, added to the context of the history of Thoth recently when she said, uh, with her sources in contact with Aya Enki, which I... I think is quite real and powerful, that historically, the reason Thoth Hermes Enki Veracuca Quetzalcoatl came here in the first place, I found this fascinating. So here's the context. So the father of Enki Ea, guy named Anu, who was the, the leader of the Anak Empire, which is one of the biggest empires in the ga galaxy, ancient, called the Dominion. So the the leader, Anu, father of Thoth, Enki, and Enlil, he gets sucked in. He gets tricked into a marriage with a Draco queen. Ooh. He gets sent, well, okay, we got properties all over the galaxy, and, and your, your first heir will inherit like a quarter of the galaxy if you just marry a Draco. Ooh, trouble, trouble, trouble. So then when Enlil is born by the, who later called Yahweh, was born by the Draco half-wife half of Anu, there was trouble, and the trouble was even... So when, when they dispatched their crew here toward the solar system... Purportedly, they needed gold to repair the home atmosphere. There's many reasons. There were resources here, and DNA is part of the gold. The gold was literally called the spice. But anyway, when they sent the team, the Anak team, to Earth, Ea, for whom Earth was named, Ea, for whom water was named, oh, 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 the EAU. <laughs> so when they dispatched the team here, guess who came along? A guy who was at that point named Ishka, later called Ningashida Thoth Hermes, came along to be, quote, the alchemy teacher for Enki Ea, and to deal with the fact that they already knew that the half-brother and Lil Yahweh, actually named U, who was half Draco, was going to be big trouble. There was trouble in the family already. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so um, Ishka at that time, later called Thoth, uh, was called the alchemy teacher. Actually, you know, I think I think Dune is actually an accurate historical rendering at this point. And it was called the planetologist Leto or Leia Kynes. Leto Kynes, Liet Kynes is the planetologist, the guy who knows how to turn planets green. That's the guy that played Thoth Hermes in the Dune series, Leto Kynes. We can go into that story. It's fun. It's about the dragon current and the spice 
must flow. And the spice occurs in the dragon lines, which are the magnetic lines of the earth. And in those magnetic lines, those dragon currents forms the gold powder because gold powder is stabilized when capacitance, capacitance is implosive, which is the well, one of the primary functions of the Ark of the Covenant, implosive capacitance designed to stabilize the gold atom in the monoatomic state, white powder, the mana, the spice must flow. <laughs> so the history story here is beautiful, it's colorful, it's intense, but we need to understand more of that context to understand what was happening later when in the battle between the brothers, it was primarily Enlil Yahweh who dispatched the planetoid that sank Atlantis named Thule after Thoth Tehute, and, and, and that blood is related to the Lesser Dryad story, as many has looked up. And so actually at that point, Enki Ea lost the battle with the half-brother Enlil Yahweh, the half-Draco, and the result was that he had to leave part of his team of planetologists here, Thoth Hermes, Veracoca, Quetzalcoatl. And what did Thoth do at that point is he went to all the centers of the most uh, advanced indigenous cultures, teaching them not just, you know, agriculture and but astronomy and ultimately how to use the magnetic line for a global wireless power grid, for example. So it was actually Thoth Hermes, we believe, who designed the fact that the circumference of the planet divided into 7.8 hertz, later the Schumann Cascade, which is a phase conjugate pump wave, which is how the pyramids called the Hummer made global wireless power by pumping out coherent longitudinal from the phase conjugate pump wave, which is the Schumann Harmonic Cascade, which was designed by Hermes, Thoth, the pyramid builder. So there's a huge context here to having the knowledge to turning planets green, having the knowledge to seed life on planets. And this is a project which is the context of millions of years, actually. And I think Elena Donat is doing a fairly good job of telling that story as well. So the story that now that we want to tell is um, of the tribes. Remember, I grew up with the Iroquois and the Seneca, and um, I began to have Kundalini symptoms, actually. Why am I telling you that now? Because the story of tribal memory that I want to tell you has to do with the fact that I developed some clairaudience after having Kundalini so, for so many years. Now, the clairaudience is how I, I learned that we were living on Cherokee Sacred Bear of the Ground at our community circle of life in Waynesville, North Carolina. And I learned that we were living on Cherokee sacred burial ground, literally the Trail of Tears. And by the way, the Cherokee name for the Ophanum ancestors, Adawi, is something I later learned. We were studying the Ophanum story with Vincent Bridges and Terry and everyone. So that set a context for me to understand how my clairaudience was evolving. Remember, I, my clairvoyance is poor and my clairaudience is undisciplined. <laughs> so I, I don't claim to be an expert at this. What I do think we understand better now is the physics, the science. And that's why I want to tell you a little bit about how I noticed that I could hear ancestors. Remember, when we teach these kids this brainwave harmonic series, EEG of implosion at flameandmind.com, and they make alpha to gamma cascade looks like a caduceus in their brain waves, a golden ratio cascading in their brain waves. And as that implosive compression happens, the kids say, oh, I see a vortex inside my head, a tunnel appears, and then a ball of light, and then an eyeball, and then they can see without their eyes. And so we're teaching kids the physics of basically bliss. And, the, <laughs> and then they see without their eyes and all the fun stuff happening. We're going to have the kids at the conference this year in September. It's going to be cool. That's our dream is to really empower the kids. But the point is that many of those kids who learn to see without their eyes correlated to alpha 
coherence in the brain waves, many of those kids become clairvoyant. They start seeing their dead grandmothers and the parents freak, at least the Western parents freak out. The Eastern parents, it's normal for them. Of course, of course you're seeing your, de your deceased ancestors. It's normal. <laughs> and it's teaching us the physics of what is clairvoyance, which is the coherent ability to prehend, which is to say to um, coherently couple with the wave front, the longitudinal or compressional wave front, exactly like the Olmec phoned ancestors with an obsidian or phase conjugate mirror, or like uh, D and Kelly, uh, you know, did their clairvoyance with angels with the black Aztec mirror, the showstone. So this ability to prehend, to couple, to phase lock with the coherence of the longitudinal is related so importantly to the physics of clairvoyance. So the physics of clair clairaudience is actually related. Um, Valerie, if you could either just close your door or turn the volume down. I'm getting an echo here. S sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was studying the physics of clairaudience at that time within my work with Bentoff. And that's a part of this story we need to tell now because it's going to set the stage for what we do in a minute with Andre Buharik and Bentoff and the ancestors. So here's the Kundalini site. So here's me. This is the documentary on the biophysics of Kundalini, which is related to the physics of Claire Audience, uh, goldenmean.info slash Kundalini. And this is my teacher, Ben Bentoff, and his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum. And here... I was actually in Bentoff's lab where this was done. These are 156 meditators tuning an audio oscillator to figure out what frequency they're hearing in the ringing in their ears during Bliss and Kundalini. You know, people who have Bliss and Kundalini, they often hear ringing in their ears. And this is almost transcending um, tinnitus. It's, it's deeper. Because, you know, uh, we we consider that our, our um, Valerie, for example, believes we know, in a way, which ancestor is calling by which ear is ringing. And so here is our study showing that the harmonic cascade of the ringing in the ears from Bliss and Kundalini, and my ringing in the ears was intense for years, and it still is. And here is the driver for those frequencies. This is the low frequencies of the sacrocranial spine liquid pump, which fit exactly, again, my equation, plonkfire.com. And that's called a phase conjugate pump wave. And that's driving here, this phonon wave, up into the ventricle liquid horns and focusing that phonon at, which is a, a sound wave traveling a liquid called phonon, which is also piezoelectric, and it's focused like a lens on the pineal pituitary complex and the beginnings of clairaudience. Now, uh, there's one more thing I need to mention here, and that is, and I'm not going to bring up the slide on that right now, but at the same time, when Bentoff was on the opposite side of the Arab-Israeli war, with Andrea Puharik, I was also studying with Andrea Puharik, who uh, had developed the physics of uh, Claire Audience unknowingly when he developed a piezoelectric transducer, which he fed a phase conjugate pump wave in bone conduction like like bone conduction headphones, which would then piezoelectrically drive the bones behind the ear to enable deaf people to hear. That's what Bentoff was doing for a living. I'm sorry, that's what Puharik was doing for a living just before he heard the voice of a guy named Tom, later identified as Atum, later identified as Aya, that became the story of Atum, Tom, which Puharik then communicated to Phyllis Schlemmer, who then communicated it to <laughs> the author of Star Trek. So Star Trek was invented because Puharik heard the voices because he was doing the physics of clairaudience. Now, 
you know, th this was a lifetime arch enemy relationship between Bentoff and Buharik, but they both tripped over the same thing indirectly, which was the physics of a kind of clear audience, actually. Now, why I'm telling this story is because the opportunity to achieve that level of communication with ancestor memory is intimately related to the story of Thoth, actually, because ancestor memory is the substance of what's called God, if you're ab Aboriginal, and ancestor memory is the substance of which, what inhabits the longitudinal coherence of the global dragon currents, the earth grid, that's what the song line dreaming tracks are, that is ancestor memory, that is what's called heaven and Plains of Sharon and Champs-Élysées, it's the coherence of that array. So the ability to inhabit that array intelligently is literally whether or not you take memory through death indirectly is your ability to inhabit that array. And that leads us to our story. Okay, now you understand a little bit, like I began to realize that sometimes I could hear ancestor memory. I heard the wailing of the women from the Trail of Tears of the Cherokee, actually, when we were living on the Cherokee sacred, sacred burial ground. And I realized, and then I heard, I heard a story of one of my relatives, a second cousin that had died in the jungle. And uh, it's, it's a long story. Anyway, so then I began to realize that in the process of dying, there's a communication with the dead, which is possible. And I had studied with uh, a, a guy named Mead who uh, did radio communication with the dead. And it's a bit of a long story. So I became very aware that on certain occasions, you remember the little boy in the movie that says, I can see dead people? <laughs> well, I can't see them, but I can hear dead people. Sometimes on my good days, and if I'm focused and if I'm coherent, which is not always. Anywho, so now we're about to go to a funeral with Valerie. <laughs> so Valerie's perhaps her best friend. Her name is Cleo. And she discovered somewhere about midlife that she had a Romany uh, gypsy ancestors. Uh, a lot of, um, you know, psychoactive uh, memories in the family, perhaps. And on one of her trips to Brazil, where she was going, she was studying ancient tapestry and clothing and uh, habits around how to, traditions around how to make sacred clothing, actually. So she went to Brazil quite a few times. And on one of her trips to Brazil, which I didn't know, actually, at the time this happened, was this happened to me at her funeral, was that she was met basically at a bus station by an Aboriginal, by an indigenous shaman who said, we've been waiting for you. And there was a shamanic tribe in Brazil whom she ended up, they had adopted her. She kind of lived with them for a while. The point was they told her that you had been part of our tribe for many generations. Now, I didn't know this at the time. So now we're on our way to, to Cleo's funeral. Remember, Cleo had been here and she suffered greatly from a form of probably Alzheimer's. And incidentally, the Therify was helpful with her Alzheimer's. She did become clearer. However, it was a short-term help and not a long-term help, part, partly in, because probably she lived several hours away and so we could only do a few sessions. We couldn't do it consistently with her. So we were not able to help her in the long term, only in the short term with her, you know, Alzheimer kind of symptoms. Anyway, so it was sad and a serious thing. And uh, just before she died, um, uh, Valerie had done a pretty intense ritual with all the friends, with Cleo. It is quite an amazing and powerful story in itself. So the part of the story that I am able to tell is we're there at the funeral. And this story leads to me having one of the most intense bliss experiences I've had in many years. And I've had many. So at the funeral, it was it looked like a church, but it was actually an art, kind of an art colony. It was a beautiful, you know, natural building. And in the front of the building is the wooden casket they just carried there of Cleo. And and Valerie took me up to the front of the church, the the, the art colony, really. And we stood right next to this wooden natural casket. And I felt a very, very, very strong presence 
like even when we had visited Cleo, you know, months or before, she still recognized me, even when she didn't recognize most anybody. It was obvious that, you know, my aura for some reason, and this has happened to me so many times, it's it, it can be a bit intimidating, that the dead person used my aura appropriately, perhaps, to uh, gain the centripetal force to clarify and then be propagated. You know, we know, for example, that we think the therify sometimes can help uh, release dead ghosts because when the plasma becomes centripetal, the charge, then you can, the spirit body, the implosive body of the plasma toroid, as it were, can become more centripetal. And that compression enables distribution into the longitudinal array, the physics of releasing ghosts who are still dizzy, basically. So anyone who has a very strong aura, perhaps. Anyway, so I felt this very intense presence and, and we stepped back and I admit I was a little bit dizzy as I felt this presence rather strong. And minutes later, I felt a strong, like the inner guides are saying, oh, you got to go. And so I told Valerie, sorry, but I have to. And she followed me. We went out the door of the church like Art Kong and across, and it was just before sunset. Remember, sunset is the magic moment, like when the birds sing, because of the longitudinal coherence at the moment of sunset, when telepathy works better, when therapy works better, and when the birds sing, because when Agni Hotra works, because sun, sunset sunrise is the moment of more coherent propagation into the longitudinal array. So just before sunset, I was driven out the door of the church and across the way from where Cleo used to live, there's uh, a special mountain called the Yellow Mountain, Mountain Jun, I believe. And the spirit guide said, direct her aura into the mountains. It was a very strong voice. And I like threw the aura that was obviously, you know, inside me. I threw it uh, into that mountain. I pointed and I, and I, even my hair is standing up right now telling this story. And minutes later, somehow I knew that the tribe had, that a tribe had come for her and they took her from that mountain, they used it as a slingshot into the heart of the sun. And I followed that aura. And I felt the most intense hair-raising bliss. It was just, I sat in the vehicle and my hair stood up and I was just electrified for like a half hour. And it was really very intense. It was obvious that she was being taken through the heart of the sun by the the shamanic tribal community and guided into the river of ancestor memory. That was what was happening. And I, I just, I, I melted. <laughs> and so then later we went nearer to where the, the burial was and the inner guide said, Shh, you know, Cleo spirit is no longer in the burial ground. No, Cleo is gone. <laughs> and I was there and I was still having this meltdown, spiritual, intense experience. And I heard, and I mean, I heard some tribal memory impress extremely strongly on me the word Cholang. Cholang. Now, at first I heard C-H-O-L-E-N-G, Cholang. It's like they wanted me to know the name Cholang. Cho they told me, Cholang, you have to remember that. And I was like scratching my head. What does Cholang mean? Is it the name of a person? What is it? Well, of course, afterwards, when I told Valerie this story, she did some research with her friends from Brazil, and we have to thank Amar. And Amar helped us locate the Cholang tribe, and now let me see if I can do this right. Um, here's the Cholang right here. Originally, I thought Cholang was C-H-O-L-E-N-G, but Amar helped us realize that XO, like in France where Marquis Shans, X was pronounced C-H. It was the Cholang, X-O-K-L-E-N-G, the Cholang tribe, extremely powerful, famous shamanic tribe in Brazil that like so many other tribes were basically tortured and basically wiped out in the tragedy of almost all the indigenous tribes of South America. And, but you have some beautiful pictures of the tribal family there. Let's see if, so you see that, and I, I will put the links to the Cholang tribal 
uh, memory and ancestry here in the show notes. The point was that we learned that the tribal ancestors had the kind of coherence to actually invite the dying into ancestral memory with such discipline and vision that it was, um, we spoke to the other children in the family and they, some of the children in the family remembered the Brazilian connection, but they didn't understand the shamanic intensity of that. So we studied this for quite some time. And in the meantime, another event happened to us again, thanks to Valerie. So Valerie's the hero of Valerie and her family is a very famous guy named Jean Mallory, who wrote many books, actually hundreds. Uh, this was called The Last King of Thule, Last Kings of Thule. And remember, Thule, Tehuti, Thule is named, we believe, for Thoth. And the reason Jean Mallory is so famous is because he, not only did he survive living with the tribes of the Inuit, uh, it, that he actually developed a relationship with the tribes of the Inuit in such a way that he became the hero of the tribes and later represented the tribes who he actually told him, you can't die yet because we need you to be our voice. And there was a whole series of books uh, in the series uh, called Terra Humane, uh, published by Plon, and there's literally a hundred or so books in that series. They're the probably the most powerful and famous anthropology work in, in all of France. And, and Valerie is much involved with that work, and I'm not as knowledgeable as I should be, perhaps. But anyway, so recently, after we had tried to actually visit John Mallory, and unfortunately he was old. Remember, he lived to be 100 years old, but he's one of the most famous anthropologists in all of France. And recently, Valerie went to her his funeral. And um, again, Valerie comes back from the funeral, and I feel this incredible, she's telling me the story, and I feel this deep, powerful rush. And I had a flash, actually, that he was had rejoined his tribe. And again, my hair stood up and I felt the power of tribal memory. And to give you another example of tribal memory, let's see if I can find this now. Um, it's slide number. Um, it's John Mallory had discovered that when the tribes place their whale bones to make a whale bone cathedral. Let me see if I can do this now. So the Whalebone Cathedral, uh, here. So this is Jean Mallory. And this is Jean discovering that when the ancient Inuit would plant their whale bones, almost in the geometry of a church, he said there was a proof that they actually understood the sacred geometry and sacred numbers. In, uh, and they, that's right, that they understood the I Ching from the 14th century. From, from the 14th century. Thank you, Val, for your help here. And so, that you know, if you, I don't know if you can imagine, there are better pictures than this, but if you can imagine the the vertebrae of a, of a giant whale with the bones lined up like a cathedral, remember, almost all or many of the ancient tribes would grind up the bones of the ancestor because the piezo in the bone would contain the longest wave of memory and they would drink the bones of their ancestors to absorb the memory. And this is uh, the, the it's called Each island special. the island had a special whale memory and it was called uh, the Baleen Alley, the, the Alley of the Whales. And there's a there's an island there. Uh, it's off Alaska, right? Is it? Uh, it's it's northeast of Siberia. Northeast Siberia. And, and so it was the Alley of the Whales. But the point was, this is a river of ancient memory. Now, um, remember, uh, we were present with Kim Kindersley when he was producing the movie Whale Dreamers. Now, let's see if we can, I'm having a real challenge getting my slideshows organized here. Right? But so if you go to goldenmean.info slash whale dreamers, let me see if I can get this together. Yes, this is the story of Buna. So here, here's the whale dreaming tribe. There's the whale. 
There's the pattern on the whale. And so the, the film Whale Dreamers, and this is Buna, our friend, this is actually his mother, at goldenmean.info slash whale dreamers. And we were there with some of the production team. Well, specifically, our friend Steve Tribeck was the Aboriginal coordinator for the movie Whale Dreamers with Kim Kinderley's, with those ancient rituals and song of the seas. And so, so in the Whale Dreamers film, uh, it's actually how we identified the plasma physics of the whale dream, which is the story of the nine, which is a film I did with Elena, which is because the whale dream actually has a certain plasma geometry. And all of that is at goldenmean.info slash whale dreamers. But in the film, the whale dreamers, the tribe is saved from extinction when they realize they can dream the whale ashore they would, for example, actually enter the mouth of the whale and do dentistry on the whale. There was such a symbiosis. And the tribe's entire identity was the fact they could dream the whales and dream the movement of the whales and have a symbiotic relationship with the whales and the song lines. Now, why would that save the existence of the tribe? And what is the physics of a whale dream? <laughs> well, it's a longitudinal coherence, a very long wave. You know, there's a famous whale that's singing at like 26 hertz. The frequencies of whale sounds are amazingly phase conjugate, as well as they are global. They're inhabiting a global phonon coherent longitudinal array. So if you can, if you can do a whale dream... <laughs> That indicates you're developing the coherence of ancestor memory, which is the only real physics of ensoulment. So again, how how is this how, how is this related to Thoth? Well, uh, Val, Val, no, but we talked about Star Trek. So the the point was that when we're going to go back to the Star Trek story when we return to the physics of the dilithium crystals and warp propulsion, and that's later in the slideshow. Okay, but but the next part of the story that we're supposed to tell here. Well, first, the, the analog with Dune, we've already mentioned that there is a real connection to the dragon current, the whale current, the dreaming track, and what was called the spice that could only occur on the magnetic lines of the dragon current, which is the gold powder. And the gold powder, remember, gold wouldn't be stable and therefore edible in the monoatomic state unless it was an implosive environment like the Ark of the Covenant. And that, that leads us to the intro to our slideshow. Now, the intro to the slideshow, I'm going to use an example. So we just watched a seven-part series, which I strongly recommend, on the meaning of of the Templars, Who Were the Templars, by Scott Walter and Tim Hogan. Tim Hogan is the Grand Master of the Templars, and Scott Walter is a Templar and a archaeo archaeologist. And uh, thank you to uh, Alex Galvez for introducing us to Scott Walter, and we're planning a conversation, actually, and I think that's going to be fun. And I'm going to use their seven-part presentation from Gaia TV as a theme to try to expand on the science of what developed in Templar memory. Now, the reason that's a good uh, segue to our slideshow is because they continuously insisted that the reason for the existence of the Templars and their purpose throughout centuries of history was to reinvent, to redeem, to restore the Atlantean Thoth uh, uh, paradise, uh, uh, a redemption event, ensoulment in the new world. That's, and that, that's the reason that Thoth was teaching them alchemy. And remember, Thoth says, yes, I'm here as the alchemy teacher. So first of all, what does alchemy mean? Alchemy means the non-destructive charge collapse I emphasize the word charge collapse, which is literally what PlancFire.com is, which enables isotope transition, non-destructive compression, and how you transition isotopes to make gold. Literally, it is to conserve spin density, which is where awareness exists. Alchemy in the aura, as well as alchemy in making gold. So 
in that series, uh, I wanted to say I admire their history work, and but I think we can do dramatic uh, extensions of the physics, actually. And that's the reason we're going to use some of that story. Uh, so, for example, in uh, Scott Walter, they're saying, well, the Ark of the Covenant, and I guess here we need the slide, share screen, slideshow, keynote, and the Ark is, I've even made some notes. Let's see if my notes work here. So the arc is slide number 40. Okay, here we go. So they're suggesting, uh, here we go, arc. Okay, so they're suggesting the arc was able to be levitated because the presence of the gold powder enabled uh, floating. Well, I suggest it's a bit more fun than that, actually, uh, that the capacitance between the gold wings on the arc was phase conjugate and implosive. And that enabled the centripetal charge that would stabilize a gold atom in a monoatomic state, enabling spin density. And when the gold atom is stable as a monoatom, it is edible. <laughs> now, the other thing is that, um, thank, and I have to thank uh, Chaz and Audra, Chaz, uh, priestessalchemy.com, I believe, who became the alchemist, gold powder maker for Pat Flatigan after I introduced them, uh, who realized that when they called the mana, the Ormies, the spice must flow, when they called that Holy Communion, they called it showbread. Well, why was it bread? Well, because they had to bake it. Well, you know why they had to bake it? <laughs> because there was a shaggy red algae, which literally field, feeds on the gold nanocolloidal called the red lion in the tanks. Remember when Giorgio Tsoukalo said, you know, if you retranslate in Ancient of Days, the, what the meaning of the word arc is, the transportable one with the tanks. Well, why was there tanks in there? Because that was holding the brew. <laughs> the brew was the shaggy red algae who was eating the gold nanocolloid and rendering it monoatomically stable and therefore edible. But before you ate it, you had to bake the bread. <laughs> this was literally the manna from heaven because there would be a sulfur residue. You got to bake it off. Otherwise, it don't taste good, actually. <laughs> so there's a very interesting story of the history of the ark. Now, we believe the ark actually, and, and I think... Uh, uh, Walter and uh, Tim Hogan got it right that there were dozens of these arcs, not just one, actually. And they show a picture in the film. And it's quite a good film. But I don't think they realize the ET context. And that's why we are here. The ET context is we believe the arc was a Syrian invention purchased by the Anak Empire to non destructively contain their nukes. Their, the nuclear radiation in the Bible was called. Um, uh, radiation poisoning was called the plague of azoth, which also means nitrogen. And uh, the plague of azoth was radiation poisoning. And implosive capacitance can contain radioactives non destructively, which is why the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia to this day causes all the custodians to die from radiation poisoning. <laughs> because actually, the Ark was a device to hold the nukes. Remember, the Anunnaki, the Anak Empire, to sail through the Van Allen belts. And there's more to this story because Van Allen belts were used in part for a quarantine to prevent them from coming in and out at the time. And there were some frequency generators in the moon, Med says, which were, by amplifying the Van Allen phenomena were preventing the coming and going of the Anak Empire, thus enforcing a quarantine. And, but that's another story. But what is clear is that the the Anak at that time, not now, but at that time, they couldn't get through the Van Allen belt without nukes. <laughs> and this is pretty clear in the Sumerian, I think. Anyway, so to have a device to hold the nukes, you needed an implosive capacitor. Orgone is really not the right term. It's 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 a Orgone is a word used by people who don't know what implosive capacitance is, actually. But so you got a, a, su, a super dielectric in the acacia, and you have the gold uh, layer and uh, the alternating layer conductor, non conductor in golden ratio proportion creates implosive capacitance. And that's centripetal enough to stabilize also gold 
in a monatomic state. And this that place was called the mercy seat. And in that arc, there was a plasma that would en enable the inhabiting of the Anak, in this case, probably Yahweh, actually. He used this for the, the, the propagation of aura. There's a whole technology here that involves what aura inhabits. So anyway, the we don't think that just putting gold powder inside the ark is what made it float. No, we think the ark was a device for making gold powder, which was the primary cottage industry for making money for the Essenes at the time when um, Akhenaten probably changed his name to Moses and became a gold powder cook. Uh, the books on the origins of the Essenes out of Egypt uh, by Ahmed Osman is pretty clear. That, uh, remember, the bloodline of Thoth, which is the name of the royal line of kings of Egypt, uh, is also literally the genetic origin of the Essenes, the Joseph and Mary story, which becomes the Black Madonna story, which becomes the Holy Grail, which is literally, literally the daughter of Thoth. You see, so then I was working with William Bueller for so many years, teaching Templar history, and the Templar history, and I'm going to show you now um, the website of 20 years of work with William Bueller. I can find it. Here we are. So here's William Bueller, goldenmean.info slash Bueller, B-U-E-H-L-E-R, who was one of the master Templars of his day, and he's doing all this work to map the geomantic grids which he calls the Rochelle grid, which the Templars called the repair of the fabric of time. And it's interesting that William Bueller said, you know, Thoth is not only the author of most of this work, they said that Thoth is like a member of the family. Uh, and um, so the graphics from this book, here's some of the, uh, the grid geometries of Europe. This is the, the places named Mary around. And this is the grid geometries uh, in North America, the Pent Grid and the El Dorado maps. And this is all related to the P Templar agenda of the repair of the fabric of time. And so the the repairing of the grid geometries, this is the, the major line through Ma Malmo. No, I'm sorry. What's that famous island there? Ah, north of... So this is uh, Arthur's seat uh, in, in Scotland, and this is what he called the Rochelle grid here, literally two hearts. And so this restore of the grid is the Templar work and the Thoth work. So you can find this all at goldenmean.info slash Bueller. Well, if I go back here, the initial graphic review. So this was L. Indisfarne, Lindisfarne. Uh, this is, yeah, this is the, this was the Astara grid called Ur Maga, uh, of the restore of the, the fabric of time, they called it, for Europe, from the ancient Templar wisdoms. And so this is a very, very elaborate uh, study in the Templars, which they identified directly with the history of Thoth. Now, um, let's see, if I have the El Dorado website. So, yeah, here, um, the when... Scott Walter says that the Templar says we were bringing the treasure of the Templar for the restoration of the new Atlantis to North America, literally the United States, and tells the whole Ben Franklin story. Um, I don't know if they realized the role of the eagle in Pennsylvania. So this is a map of the center of Pennsylvania, and this is the eagle's head on the Appalachians. And this is, yeah, and here is the actual uh colored soils map of central Pennsylvania. And the eye of the eagle here, named Oriole in Pennsylvania, is where the shaman took their, their initiates to learn vision, actually. And, and this was called the Seven Notch Seven Valley uh, of the, the Women in the Wilderness uh, history, which was an attempt to bring the new Atlantis to North America. And this fits into the other stories from uh, the Newport Tower. And um, so um, 
the relationship of the de spiritual destiny of the Americas, um, let me see, we'll tell more of later, but uh, at that time I had uh, stayed with uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages author Manley Hall, who his wife, Marie Bauer Hall, believed had been murdered, and I stayed with her to help her at that time. And uh, they were teaching about the secret destiny of the Americas, uh, the Bruton Parish Vaults, which they believe was the proof that Bacon was Shakespeare, which was really the proof of the Templar agenda, which fits later with now what Alan Green is teaching about uh, the real Shakespeare, which is actually the memory of the spiritual destiny of uh, the new Atlantis in the new world. Anyway, and part of that story I had written up in this uh is called the Tantric Swoon of Magdalene, which um, remember when the Templar story, even as Scott Walter tell it, begins with Bernard of Clairvaux in part, uh, having a lucid dream, being approached by what apparently is a black Madonna, uh, showing him where to locate the Gothic cathedrals on a map of Europe, which became they found that the Gothic cathedrals are a map of Virgo on Europe. And uh, the Black Madonna came to Bernard of Clairvaux in a dream and told him where the cathedrals should be, which turned out to be at places where there's a magnetic line cross called a cistern, the, the, the Jed uprising of the underground water, later called the Cistercian Abbeys which were a magnetic map on the land of the stars in the Tantric Swoon of Magdalene. And there's a book on this, and you can read about that at goldenmean.info slash Magdalene here. The point is that, um, that the here's, here's some of the star map information, that the dream of the Madonna was the restoration of the grid of Earth as a map of lens projection back into the stars. And when Magdalene had a tantric swoon, the body of her lover Christos was the body of the stars. Meditate on that for a moment. <laughs> See if you can figure out what that means. Well, in short, the Templar history was an attempt to restore the ability for what we would call ensoulment related to what Enki calls Adam Cadmon, which is the possibility of the waveguide of genetics to inhabit a larger body, literally soul. So practically at the moment of death, if you're on a magnetic cross, in a magnetic grid, with your attention coherent, the synaptic array that you were inhabiting which is a longitudinal coherence. It's literally a hologram inside your head. You are inhabiting an array now. Absolutely. It's literally a net of fireflies. Well, when you die, you must learn to inhabit a larger array. <laughs> Call it lucid dreaming. Call it coherent longitudinal interferometry, which is my preference. But basically, the longitudinal coherence that indicates you can lucid dream, measurably triggered by implosive harmonics, plonkfire.com, that... Longitudinal coherence, Ba from the Ka, Kez John body, rainbow light bottle, is what you can take with you and become centripetal and thus inhabit a larger array, the nodes of the bigger grid. And that skill, which most people would call ensoulment, was available to those DNA, those whose blood, whose DNA, was coherent enough to implode, called the Holy Grail. <laughs> which is the bloodline of Thoth, obviously. In, an, an indicator, for example, was the presence of Kundalini, which caused Lucifer, the horns, or the horns of Moses, is the, is the uh, ventricle liquid cornu, the horns, which would phase coherent when the phonon was coherent in the Kundalini phenomenon. So the enabling of Kundalini is literally an indication of the presence of the grail bloodline, because you're obviously able to propagate largely much more powerfully into that longitudinal array. Well, have I successfully introduced anything? I don't know. We are trying to, we're trying here to set a context for a big picture. The big picture, remember, is Anki gets here 
And he's been paid by his Draco family, the Anu, to do the cloning to make gold mining slaves, which is relatively boring and probably depressing. Uh, and then he discovers, oh, there's 22 extraterrestrial species who planted seeds in the DNA here. And the blood is based on iron instead of chlorophyll called Adom. I mean, red, I mean, Adam, the Adamic race. And the iron in that blood means we're going to be able to hold more lightning in this blood than he's ever seen before, which means potential. We could cook this DNA up into something very valuable. In fact, earth-shaking, quite literally. <laughs> so he comes up with a plot and, and tr tricks the Draco who are, playing, who are paying him just to do cloning to instead cook up, some, cook up, cook up something far more magical. And he gets his lead alchemist, to set the stage for a condition where humans could evolve to become extremely psychokinetic. Remember, all everybody agrees, Elena Denon, they all agree, the galaxy is based on trade. It's simple. Everybody's just trading out there. There's a few wars, but basically it's trade. And what is the most valuable item in all that trade? <laughs> DNA. And what's the most valuable item in the DNA is the ones who have a soul. Why did the Grays and the Dracos pay <laughs> the ones who tricked MJ-12 to only abduct those with indigenous blood? They were after the lucid dreamers. Why? Because they knew. <laughs> the grail, the implosion in that blood was big bucks. I mean, high leverage. I mean, high value. I mean, tornado steering. So... On that note, I see it's almost nine o'clock and I've carried on ridiculously, but I'm just about to start ben, this logic. What's the web address of that uh, page that you were showing with the dark background? Yes, um, that it was the Magdalen, the, the tantric swoon of Magdalen at goldenmean.info slash Magdalen, uh, which was a part of the Earth Heart book, uh, which Vincent Bridges edited. And uh, that's also going to bring us to the Emerald Tablets section. So the conclusion of this show is the slideshow, especially focused on the Emerald Tablets, which were discussed recently by Elena Denon and also discussed recently by Scott Walter and the Templar History. And so that has led us to our slideshow. And hopefully this will be thematic enough that we can follow the theme. So... <clears throat> This is a new history, a new way of looking at the, the history of Thoth, Hermes, Viracocha. What were they here doing trying to create soul in the blood? This is the new t-shirt for plonkfire.com. <laughs> Remember, there's prizes. If you send us pictures of kids wearing this t-shirt, we send presents to you. <laughs> Dear science teacher, the reason you are creating a generation of soulless Borgs, soul, hint, uh, Thoth knew about that, is because you don't know why objects fall to the ground and therefore why anything is electrically centripetal, like fractal charge implosion, like life force, gravity, seed germination, sacred architecture, and consciousness, and how you get a soul. So if you can't teach why objects fall to the ground, obviously you are going to be soulless. So read plonkfire.com and let's have no longer soulless science teachers. Hello, this is our t-shirt for the day. Okay. <laughs> so it, it, essential physics here uh, in terms of why objects fall to the ground, it, it, as in the famous EM electromagnetic drive, is that the microwave in the trapezoid implodes or phase conjugates. And at the centripetal point here, down the throat of that vortex, the transverse EMF is squeezed and spits through the nozzle of the squirt gun and emerges as a longitudinal EMF, the only physics and stuff of gravity waves. So when the longitudinal EMF is directed, propelled directionally, that is asymmetrically in one direction only, that is called a gravity drive. Hello. And this is going to give us a new understanding of the Mercury vortex drive, the Vimana, the Nazi bell. So down the Mercury vortex, and this is this is a secret, is going to be developed in more detail in an upcoming lecture of, from myself at fractalu.com entitled 
pyramidwirelesspower.com, and we'll be going into this more detail. But the brief summary is, and why you need to know this in order to understand what Thoth is doing, is to understand what's happening in the vortex. Imagine this vortex is the vortex of charge in the superfluid of charge plasma called your mind. So your mind is literally that vortex. And when it comes to a point or is squeezed by something which is implosively centripetal, like a golden ratio cascade in your EEG called flameandmind.com. So when that vortex becomes implosively centripetal, at the nozzle of the squirt gun, the transverse EMF is spit out as a longitudinal wave compressionally and directionally. And that is why the Vimana Nazi bell flew. And we are going to tell you some secrets about that that no one has ever learned before. Hello. We learned, for example, why the mercury was red. In all of the Vimana Nazi stories, it's a red mercury. Well, it turns out that they put an iron powder. The secret is the wetting agent to make the iron powder soluble. And that's our little secret sauce. It's uh, our Kentucky Fried Chicken secret sauce. Is what's the wetting age? So anyway, when you make the iron powder soluble in the mercury, the mercury becomes conductive. But now I'm going to tell you something that no one in history has ever explained on this planet. Why is that mercury vortex famously often radioactive? No one has ever explained that before on this planet. I'm going to tell you right now. Because just as in Paul Brown's nuclear battery, a extremely low level of radioactivity made the electron array quasi superconductive. Ooh, they could get enough radioactivity from welding rod to make the Paul Brown nuclear battery. And that would enable that gamma, low level gamma would, would radiation would actually create a quasi superconductor. So if you want the mercury vortex to be quasi superconductive, you need your mercury to be low level radioactive. Hello, nobody on this planet has explained that before. And that superconductivity would then enable the longitudinal wave propelled out the center to be more directional. And calling that the vril, in my view, is common but childish because it's the wrong term. It's longitudinal coherent EMF. So this is how it's happening. And this is at the throat of that vortex, you have what's called the grail. <laughs> Choosing passion. And we played this many times. You've seen them. But you see what the grail is. When this happens in blood, perfect embedding, self, not self, squirting pine It becomes implosive. So it is the physics of gravity making in blood. And revolving that It's the physics of bliss in blood. You know, we've done that too many times. Okay. And so the angle of that vortex, uh, as uh, uh, Charlie Z helped helpfully figured out a 76.34 degrees, is because that makes the piezoelectricity golden ratio and therefore implosive, therefore recursive, therefore plasma projective, therefore gravity making. So this is, again, the picture of the vortex. This is why Schauberger's vortex made gravity and it made electricity from gravity because being piezo, there was an electrical pressure difference between the narrow point and the wide Point. And that voltage difference is actually how you made voltage from gravity. And that is the physics of the Vril, the, the Nazi bell, the Vimana, a mercury vortex story. And so we actually made gravity by winding coils implosively. You can read about that at fractalfield.com slash implosion. And here is this, if you align the so the Earth equator with the solar equator with the galactic equator, and then have that recursive spin phase align. Like not only is sunrise, sunset lining up, equinox, solstice is lining up, but galactic equator is lining up. And that becomes initiatory into a larger mind because of the longitudinal coherence at the 90 degree cross points. Okay, next part of the slideshow is the story of the Emerald Tablets. I think Elena Danan made a major contribution even recently here, explaining what the Emerald Tablets are doing in Enki's library aboard Nibiru in the orbit of uh, Saturn and um, Jupiter. That uh, the, the Emerald Tablet was actually basically holographic library of memory, but as it's been recorded on Earth, Thoth's, it's called the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, that uh, the Emerald Tablets were 
one of the most famous alchemic texts in existence and root of much of the Templar wisdom. So in my second book, Earth Heart, goldenmean.info slash book two, edited by Vincent Bridges, Vincent suggested that I had created a new emerald tablet. Now, Vincent was one of the best, probably, alchemists and historians on the planet at the time, in my humble opinion. Uh, and so he wrote uh, his translation of the Emerald Tablets, referred to also by Scott Walter in the History of the Templars. That which is below is like that which is above. Ooh, this is the, the how things proceed in unity as above, so below. And the so the microcosm fits the macrocosm, earth and fire, from earth to heavens. Basically, he's saying that if you understand the golden sun as above, so below, recursion perfected, fractality perfected, compression perfected, alchemy perfected, then you understand the principle of the universe. That's what he, Vincent is saying the Emerald Tablets text is. So here is me who had not heard of the Emerald Tablet at the time, in about uh, 1987. That's a while ago, isn't it? So I didn't know who Thoth was. I didn't know what the Emerald... But I was... I realize now that Thoth is whispering in my ear, basically. <laughs> Remember, I wake up and and uh, Teresa and Alan, our Ophanum experts, say, well, Thoth is an old family friend that's whispering in my ear. And uh, William Bueller, the Templar expert, says, Thoth is an old friend that just whispers in my ear. <laughs> and and the, the Templars say, well, Thoth has been whispering in our ear for, you know. So I think probably Thoth was whispering in my ear, too. And this is what I wrote something like 50 years ago. The universe is made of one substance. The compressibility of this universal media, I now call it a superfluid, sorbs form and memory and wave shape. The universe has one sh wave shape, the, wa the sine wave. And Fourier transform means that you add these sine waves in different frequencies and you get everything, which is a standing wave. And I said, the ratio is sacred and the scale is profane. Well, guess what? I missed something there because the scale is sacred too, if you know what Planck fire is. So the ratio is sacred and the scale, but I was close. And then I would say, focus is the only medium that creates implosion. Shape is the only thing the universe has to conserve. The only way to conserve shape along a path is to maintain the ratio, the <laughs> golden ratio. You, so I'm going on and on. DNA is a four-dimensional dodecahedron. Light, when folded back upon itself, comes to know itself. So then Vincent says, this new emerald tablets contains the keys to a vast synthesis of science and spirituality. This is me writing 50 years ago, not even knowing who Thoth was at that point. So I think it was pretty, pretty cool. And this was the, uh, the Tibetan emerald tablet. So we think the emerald tablet now is actually a holographic memory. Remember, the Magdalen article is entitled The Green Stone. And when planets turn green, they become part of this hologram. And that's a bigger picture. This is just a reminder that if we look at across the, the on the top here is the family name of the main Anak family, Anu Dad, Enki, Enlil, and Thoth Hermes. And if you go down the column, you see what that name meant in Egypt, in Greece, in Rome, in Babylon, in Africa, and Christianity. So in Egypt, Enki was Ptah Atun, and he was, and Lil was Amun, and Thoth was Tehute, Thoth Tehuti, which became David. And, and for example, in Greece, uh, Enki is Poseidon. Et so this is meaning that the term Thoth had meaning in almost every culture on the planet. Finally here, and we'll go to questions in a, in a minute, but just, I have to tease Scott Walter and uh, Tim Hogan from their Templar series, because they're talking about the fact that the Virgin in the Rocks painting uh, had the son of John, the Baptist, and the son of Jesus, who they don't know, but we know it was named John Trephine, actually. And Vincent took us to the cave where this painting was designed and had us look out the window 
in that cave, we were there, Arl, in Arl in South France, in our Grail Tour Mysteries, and he took us to the stone out that window right here, La Pyramid in the quarry at Glanum in saint Remy de provence which shows up prominently in the painting about the bloodline of John, the son Trophim of Jesus and John. Now, if you happen to know who John Trophim is, which I don't think Scott Walter knew, actually, here's John Trophim. John Trophim woke up in his sarcophagus, not quite dead. <laughs> And his aura was so strong that when he lifted his knee, it made a knee print in the platinum stone at the top of his sarcophagus, his cask, his grave. And he melted that stone with the shape of his knee print, which a Roman legion carried around for decades, later named the Grail Platon, the origin of the Grail story was how he melted that stone, John Trophim. And the Essenes know how he made the aura to do it, exactly like a few centuries earlier, Padmasambhava melted the stone with his hand in Nepal. Now, it was Vincent Bridges who pointed out to me that Padmasambhava was actually the name Sam, who's Anki's other name. Hello! Who's doing the stone melting with their aura anywho? And how do you get an aura strong enough to melt the stone? I think it's plasma physics. And I think there's a hygiene here. And there's some very fun clues about how you get a soul. Anyway. <clears throat> so the other thing that Scott Walter mentioned in the, uh, the Templar history was Fulcanelli, which Fulcanelli, as you probably know, means volcano. But the thing that Fulcanelli is actually famous for is that the sequence of glyphs on the cathedral walls, external to those walls, was actually the symbols of how to do alchemy. And if you do put those glyphs one above the other, in ancient architecture, this is called Sima Erecta and Sima Reversa. Not too many people know about this, but ancient architects do. And you know what that is? That is the fact that the shape of the carved stone on the surface of the sacred cathedral is actually a microwave guide. Actually, it's Bob Dratch who showed me that the insects navigate by the microwave guide in the stone carvings on the pyramid walls. Why? Because insects are microwave antenna. And this might get a little too deep for you, but I was there when Bob Dratch measured the microwave, adenoside diphosphate, the ATP microwave, 1.91 angstrom. And when she, he scanned for that, which is the ultimate Kundalini scanner and could replace every hospital scanner on the planet, if the U.S. military hadn't stolen it from Bob Dratch short, shortly after they stole the GPS science from him. But anyway, so if you scan for that microwave on the spine, it's the ultimate kundalini measurement tool because the density of ADP, adenosine diphosphate microwave in the spine is the waveguide physics of kundalini and the waveguide of cellular radio. So he showed us with the same microwave antenna that you could scan the horizon for the same microwave and prove that the earth grid was profoundly symbiotic to cellular microwave, the real physics of telepathy. Anyway, the microwave guides then on the cathedral walls as a, a waveguide, Sima erecta or Sima reversa means whether the geomantic charge is centripetally or centrifugally being directed up the wall of the church because it's determining the physics of geomancy. It's quite a fun story. <clears throat> so uh, just kind of wrap this up just a little bit. So I think one thing I suggest we meditate on recently when Elena Denon is explaining that after the Andromedans helped install the hollow metal artificial moon to restore orbital stability about, probably about the time of the Lesser Dryad, after the basically the Federation tried to nuke the reptilians out of here, and they failed, and they messed up, and Mars lost its atmosphere, Tiamat melted. It was colorful. Anyway, the moon they installed had consciousness for a propulsion motor. And when 
uh, Enki and Elena are looking at that motor, they say it looks like an astrolab, like a series of concentric rings which are circulating plasma implosively. And they say that consciousness directly inhabits the propulsion drive motor. It's one step beyond crystal propulsion, the dilithium crystals. Anyway, they had to get the cold ass, which is the part of the advanced culture partners with the Andromedans to advise them on how the coordinates work to reinstall the consciousness in the propulsion drive motors, which is at the center of our hollow metal moon. And, and they said the Kuldas were the only ones who could teach the Zenate, the Andromedans, how the moon worked, which has the same kind of drive mechanism at the center of Niburu, which Anki Ea currently inhabits in the orbit outside Jupiter and Saturn. Interesting how the name Kaldas here, the Kaldasians depicted by uh, looks suspiciously similar to the Cardassians in Star Trek, which they learn from Andrea Puharic in Star Trek. It's just a colorful story. But you see, the point is that the advanced cultures know how to make artificial planetoids. And this becomes just a, a closing note on trying to optimize the physics. I suggest that when um, Elena Denon uses Dan Willis to teach the physics of crystal propulsion, that their physics is sadly incomplete. And that problem in the understanding that physics came directly from Marcel Vogel, who I think I probably knew better than Dan Willis. And the essential Marcel Vogel problem is right here. The Marcel Vogel crystals do not have parallel sides. Now, if you look at the implosion crystal, this was called Kosky Frost Crystal. The Kosky Frost Crystal, 400, 800 times its own weight in gravity making and use a phase conjugate pump wave to pump it, to implode it. Uh, and this is well documented. You can read it. The whole book by Elizabeth Bill Donovan at fractalfield.com slash propulsion. The point is that this crystal cannot be driven with a single frequency, which is what Dan Willis had suggested incorrectly. So those like Marcel Vogel, who do not know what a phase conjugate pump wave is, attempt to artificially create an implosive heterodyne cascade by making the side walls of the crystal not parallel and therefore being implosive. Marcel Vogel didn't know what a phase conjugate pump wave was. I actually was with him there in Toronto when he was using that crystal to control. We had a polygraph connected to the plant and the plant was responding to the crystal. And Marcel Vogel was able to get the crystal to control the metabolism of that plant. And we measured it with a plant polygraph, which is just like GSR, actually. <laughs> Point being uh, that what is naturally intended to allow you to be the implosion, to drive a crystal, is this phase conjugate pump wave harmonic series, which is the physics of the sacrocranial harmonics, what drive Kundalini. And obviously the low frequencies in the spine liquid pump are exactly my equation called PlanckFire.com. So the low frequency spine liquid pump driving Kundalini is a perfect phase conjugate pump wave. And if you can make that inside your body, then you can use a real crystal and implode it and make a longitudinal wave out the tip. But if you don't know what a phase conjugate pump wave is, then instead you make the sides of the crystal not parallel to try to approximate a phase conjugate pump wave, which is unsustainable and not accurate and, and not self-generating. So the point is that when Dan Willis says you just put one frequency in this crystal and drive it, he obviously doesn't know what a phase conjugate pump wave is and doesn't know how to efficiently make a longitudinal wave in an implosive piezo crystal called the dilithium crystals in Star Trek or the Kosky Frost crystal in the books on the physics of that crystal. And if you look at the crystal at the center of the Excelsior craft, you can see that crystal is going to have parallel sides. It's not a crystal that has a concave or has a conic shape. No, it, as this crystal did, and as the real Atlantean fire crystal did. So you need to understand how that gravity is made in the crystal. And we're going to go in much more detail on that in our Pyramid Wireless Power talk, showing how this harmonic cascade 
of the Schumann Cascade is pumped by the pyramids into the longitudinal array that makes global wireless power. So this is a little section on um, how the insect skeletons make gravity, and we'll do that in the next lecture too. And this is showing how these wormholes work. But I see it's 920 and we're a bit out of time here. So um, we're going we're gonna to finish the science section here in the lecture Pyramid Wireless Power, a future lecture at fractalu.com. In summary, have we told, have we retold, have we made a bigger picture out of the history of Thoth Hermes? Have we hermetically sealed this into a caduceus, <laughs> the grail? We have seen that the big picture here is about pure principle. And we're only using the per personality stories as a teaching tool to learn pure principle. We're avoiding miracle worship, we're avoiding personality worship, and we're being empowered by the understanding of pure principle, which is absolutely immortal. So I hope you enjoyed this little introduction to the uh, new history of Thoth Hermes. I hope that was fun for you. And uh, too fun. do we have any fun questions? Yes, we have a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with Mara's questions. So first one, do you think that the order of Dune was remembering or hearing the song lines, likewise, George Lucas. The Order of Dune? I missed the first part of the question. The Order of Dune. The Order? Oh, the author. The author. Oh, the of author Dune. of Dune. Oh, yeah, the author of Dune. Sorry. Uh, what do, do I think he, he well, uh, um, the author of Dune, Frank Herbert, was obviously tuned into Anak history in great detail. Leto Kynes was obviously Anu, and uh, uh, Muabdib, uh, Paul Atreides, was obviously Enki. It's, it's absolutely clear, clear. And Enki and Muabdib, Paul Atreides, wakes up to find out his real dad, Harkonnen, is half machine Draco. And Harkonnen wakes up and he, had, he needs suspensors. He needs an electric field in order to prevent aging, which is exactly the story of, I will raise a shem unto the Lord for the Draco who got here and catastrophically started aging because they had lost ensoulment. So the story of Dune has an amazing amount of real history for sure. And, and in the question, did you say, and compare that to what was the second part of the question? Uh, to um, hearing the song lines yes yes exactly the song lines in dune are literally the dragon currents occupied and inhabited by the sandworm and the byproduct the metabolism of the sandworm literally a dragon current you should read the book dragon in the ice castle by david yarrow my friend so the song line dragon current literally comes out of the earth and, and flies so the byproduct the meta metabolism of the dragon current is the spice, the gold powder, the spice must flow. Now, if you understand indigenous wisdom, you do not remove the gold from the soil because it's enabling the earth grid to be conjugate and fractal and centripetal. And if you if if you remove the mineral and it's no longer enables a magnetic line to be inhabitable, your climate would go into chaos. Does that sound familiar? Um Continuation, are you saying the pyramids are what create the green on the planet or the pyramids balance it? What are the pyramids doing now? The green was there before, wasn't it? Why are they tuning free energy or what? Is it like the Akash network generator for the song lines, creating a grid of communication? What and why were they tuning the earth? So the Akash is a name for the longitudinal array. The pyramids, by focusing the Schumann harmonics, which are a beautiful phase conjugate pump wave hoof harmonics, are literally plonkfire.com. By focusing the phase conjugate pump, pump wave to a vertex node and squeezing out the transverse inertia out the tip, the nozzle of the squirt gun, the point of the pine cone, cone emerges as longitudinal coherence pumped into the array of the earth called global wireless power, which is why the pyramids were called the Hummer and are literally a gravity diode. 
And if a planet is losing its atmosphere, you need gravity diodes really badly. <laughs> you got to implode that transverse into longitudinal coherence to make an array, which is centripetal and therefore stable, if you want to hold atmosphere. This was called planet taming in the book Two Thirds by David Myers David. Percy, and this is a plan literally to hold atmosphere on planets because it's a tightrope. Got too much gravity, you, you can't have life, but, but you'll have some atmosphere. And if you have too little gravity, you can't have atmosphere either. You got to have a little tightrope there, and you need planet taming to do it, which means tuning the grid on the surface with plant with gravity diodes called the Hummer or the Pyramid. That all that whole story is that pyramidwirelesspower.com. And absolutely, that coherent longitudinal array that's being pumped into coherence, then you can pick up that gravity wave coherence, a longitudinal node at the nodes using things like the Ark of the Covenant. Did you know that the Ark of the Covenant doesn't work unless you plant it at an Earth magnetic grid line cross point, which is why the Templars at Sintra know, which they, with I don't think Scott, uh, uh, um, I don't think the authors of the Templar series know that, but the our Templar sponsors at Sintra showed me the pictures of where the Michael line enters the cave off St. Michael's Island in the Azor, exactly on the Michael line, which is where the real arc was, or one of the major arcs was. And the reason you had to plant the arc at a magnetic line cross point, also where Therify works better and cathedrals work better, is because that centripetal force enables the arc to work, the gravity diode. So it's all about this dodeca ecosa earth grid of longitudinal nodes where telepathy is enabled, where nuclear critical mass is re re reduced. It's absolutely about understanding that array. I don't know, how, I, how did I do with that question? Awesome, thank you, I understand now. <laughs> great, okay, hey, great, thank you, thank you. Uh, next question to Fanner. Yes. Since you mentioned Yathe Wathe, could you please share whether you have studied the physics of the keys of Enoch? Well, you know, at my article, uh, goldenmean.info slash Yahweh, I show that the phonon geometry, if you pronounce Yodhe Vohe accurately, is two opposing light cones as we replicated spectrograms of the Hebrew alphabet by Carlos Suarez in my first book, Alphabet of the Heart. So, the phonon of a, uh, the geometry of two opposing light cones, this power spectra of properly pronounced Hebrew letters being the shape of the letters themselves for obvious psychokinetic regions, the optical hologram is the audio hologram. It's pretty cool. Anywho, so Yahweh was a name for two opposing light cones. So to call someone a Yahweh was just to, to say this was someone who could inhabit opposing light cones. In this case, this is literally the plasma shape of Orion. You can see the pictures, goldenmean.info slash Orion. So for Enlil Yahweh, half Draco, and obviously the largest plasma parasite probably in the history of the solar system, literally called the Grim Reaper, not a good guy. For him to call himself Yahweh was, was like, he's a wannabe. He ain't the real thing. Uh, because... Um, we believe that like many of the ascended masters frozen in the astral because of inability to make their own bliss juice condemned to parasitically eating human plasma as their only way to survive that um that that yahweh was literally the largest plasma parasite in the solar system named the grim reaper who comes to eat your soul at death if you don't get it actually and that ann rice had a lot of that story correct when he she said the, the ancestor of all vampires was a guy named E-N-K-I-L. If you understand your history a little bit, the pieces start falling into place. Um, but there was more to that question about Yahweh and, oh, about um, Keys of Enoch. We believe, I believe that Enoch was a name for one of the most advanced genetic experiments of Anki Ea, who was then, um, we could say, uh, abducted by the Draco ancestors for inspection. The high Draco ancestors, ringed dragons, are connected to what we call a seraphim. 
And we're not always parasitic. No. Uh, the high dragons were a very advanced culture. I think the story of um, Theuba, it's a French book, Theuba, about returning to Thuban, <laughs> uh, which is in Draco, uh, to find the Draco ancestors, which our, our recent secret space program survivor we interviewed here uh, said, you know, the Queen Draco. Um, at that time, the Draco were uh, breeding hermaphroditically. That is to say, they were asexual. But when they dis when they converted to breeding sexually, a disaster happened and they lost long-term memory in what we would call ensoulment and became partially parasitic. And this relates to the fact that even the Draco, whom we call the fallen ones today, referring to the inability to take memory through death, they literally forgot how to make a soul. And loss of long-term memory is an a key indicator of loss of ensoulment. And that should sound familiar to humans who have lost long-term memory. Next one. Can we create our own arrays with placing people in some way over the planet and then do some phase locking coherence work? Oh, that's a fun and wonderful thing to do. Absolutely. You get your shaman and you place them at the nodes of the array and you start your hologram cooking. You'll be steering tornadoes in no time. Fabulous, fun, cool, good. Yes. <laughs> okay. I will ask. But why, again, are they in need of gold slaves if they can alchemize as much as they want? Well, uh, specifically, we believe at that time they didn't weren't able to alchemize their own gold powder, actually, uh, to make their own gold. Now we know that temperature and frequency to convert uh, copper into gold, for example, and, and many with transmutation is now we understand a lot more of that physics. Uh, but... Um, at that time, uh, they were desperate for gold. And you can restore atmosphere in part on a planet. I think Sitchin got part of that right, uh, using gold because obviously it's so phase conjugate. And if you distribute it in a, an array, that grid will become more centripetal. And you may help retain atmosphere, absolutely. And so they were desperate for gold at that time, not now. And uh, so, of course, uh, mining that gold was a pain in the ass and they wanted slaves to do it. And... And, you know, they thought we just were slaves here, but Enki, he saw more. He saw a gene pool that could become the vaccine for the Orion Wars. Adam asks, I'm wondering what Dan thinks about Anton Park's theory that the name Marduk was a title that different beings had and not a name. I'm also wondering if Dan thinks Ea Toth would normally be visible to our physical eyes. Well, of course, Elena Danan claims to meeting Ea Enki regularly, very visible. Uh, I think Enki at that time did look more like a frog and, uh, you know, the green Poseidon, and that Anton Parks got that picture probably correct. I think Anton Parks' history is fabulous, useful. Uh, I highly recommend. I think the tragedy is that Anton Parks seems to refuse to bring his history up to the present by being introduced to Elena Danan, that's all. But the, historically, Anton, I have that summary very nicely at fractalfield.com, says Zeitlin, Z-E-I-T-L-I-N, for Jerry Zeitlin. But in terms of Marduk, remember, I think Elena got that very right, that Marduk, the beautiful son of Enki and much loved, was uh, tricked to the bad side and later was named probably Lucifer uh, by Enlil Yahweh, the Draco, uh, purposely to hurt Enki Ea, that's the story. And yes, uh, remember, the Anunnaki changed names probably more frequently than I changed socks. And they uh, do, did it uh, specifically whenever there was an occasion to celebrate. <laughs> and yes, uh, many, if not most of the Anunnaki names were both a name for an office and a name for a person. For example, Christ, Christos is actually a name for that which crystallizes, becomes centripetal. So it's a name for an office, actually. The name Yahweh was a name for those who can inhabit a double vortex light code. So yes, the name and the title and the shape and the purpose are one, absolutely. But was was the name for that title then assumed locally? Was it earned or was it 
a wannabe. In the case of Yahweh and Lil, he was a wannabe. He wasn't a real Yahweh because he actually couldn't steer a tornado. No, it, literally, he's the epitome of soullessness. Uh, and that is borne out in when Elena describes the trial of Enlil U uh, for with Anu after they ejected the Draco from the solar system. So, yes, they were names for offices in many cases, as well as names for persons. Uh, Mara asks, what are your thoughts about Matthias de Stefano? Is he trying to repair the greed and time like the Templars? You know, I've watched a few of Matthias de Stefano's programs. Uh, he's talking about the OOP. What do you call OOP? All of it. The, uh, the ancient tribes of South America. I think he's a wonderfully sweet guy, highly intuitive, and probably a good shaman, and fabulous memories, and zero understanding of science. And that is a serious limitation, unfortunately, it, it, which in, to some extent describes uh, many of our other you know, channels of the day, but you really need some science to put this together in an empowering way. But still, Matthias de Stefano, I think he's a sweet, wonderful kind of a hero and a bit of a shaman. Uh, and many South American shamans echo the themes he's presenting. Very useful work. Um, Terry has an interesting and very long question. Um, I would like to invite Terry to ask this. Terry, are you there? Terry, Teresa? Maybe I'll just start reading. If she's around, she can join. She's probably so, helping. Alan. Alan was not feeling well. So maybe. go ahead. All right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Dan about his understanding of the fall of Atlantis. According to what Dan said in the opening, which matches what, what has been said by Tim Hogan, it was a planetoid that hit Earth and caused the fall of Atlantis. Alan and I have interacted with various people who have had spontaneous recall of the fall of the of a place now called Atlantis. In fact, he has had that sort of spontaneous recall himself. In commonality of the story is that their incredible technology, which easily makes things like alchemy possible, as well as many other things that today we might just call magic, led to a long period of peace and spiritual growth while interacting with ET teachers who had basically genetically engineered them. A movement started that one might call Earth for Earthlings. You may remember that Vincent Bridges also spoke about this and wrote a story about it. One thing led to another and the incredible crystal-based technology, the same thing that made alchemy possible, fell into the earth. My question, is there room for this interpretation memory with the planetoid impact story? Could that story itself be a kind of memory insert? Oh, I'm so glad that Terry was here to ask fun questions. Mm. Um, so two versions of the story of the fall of Atlantis. One related the story I just told from many sources that Basically, Enlil the Draco managed to steer a deadly, call it a planetoid or meteorite, that basically wiped out Atlantis, uh, directly intended to wipe out Enki, Thule, for whom Atlantis was named, and why the Palladians uh, actually <laughs> um, called Atlantis reptilian, just because <laughs> that's another story. But... Uh, so the one story is, yes, it was a planetoid directed by the bad guys that wiped out Atlantis. The second story, the Atlantean fire crystal called Tuoi Stone by uh, Edgar Cayce and the fire crystal physics, what I just spent a great deal of time talking about, um, that is blamed also for the fall of Atlantis. Now, interestingly, it is said that because the Atlantean priests originally under Thoth Hermes at Thoth and Enki, but ultimately susceptible to very um, uh, many controversies in the evolution of the Atlantean culture, not 
ultimately under the control of, of Thoth and Enki, although originally the, the you know, even concentric rings of water and land, which is a perfect implosive capacitor, which obviously is why Atlantis was called Atlatl, which means a projectile, because it was a projector of coherent longitudinal. That's why the water, land, concentric rings were perfectly implosively capacitive. That's what Atlantis was. Uh, and that's a good design, by the way. Enki didn't, you know, and so that was a good design. However, uh, the fire crystal technology, the toy stone technology, was clearly misused. Absolutely, they're right. We know Atlantean scientists who remember this all too well. Uh, Lewis Acker, for with whom who wrote co-wrote Handbook of Astrology with Francis Lacoyan and friend for many years. Lewis Acker woke up from too much LSD. Remembered his. Atlantean lifetimes so intensely that we did years of project on the Atlantean fire crystal, including meeting with crystal companies in Rochester, et cetera, doing the fire crystal work. And yes, that crystal was used to enslave people. And yes, that crystal entrained the Schumann harmonics in a way that caused earthquakes. Absolutely, as did Tesla, who did not understand that longitudinal waves are gravity waves. No, and his global wireless power failed because he got the frequency signature wrong and he got the node, nodal locations for the pickup and receive wrong because he didn't understand the actual fractal array of longitudinal waves, although he was doing plasma projection with longitudinal, which is what Tesla coils do. So anyway, yes, you know, did the fire crystal help destroy Atlantis? Yes, but was the ultimate destruction you know, a, a planetoid aimed by the bad guys, the Draco, to wipe out Enki? Yes. So I think those stories do fit together and they fit together also in the sense of a karmic lesson, which was if we don't understand implosion in the liquid crystal, which is how DNA makes bliss, and implosion in a physical crystal, which is what a fire crystal is, then we are going to have to repeat that karma. We don't learn the lesson of history. We are condemned to repeat it. Thank you. One last question from Oscar about ensoulment. It needs the charge density of orgasm, and I assume it rings out into subtler harmonic layers, soul, and compress them down here. Is artificial insemination then completely soulless or just extremely poor latency to heaven? It's absolutely true that the higher voltage of orgasmic insemination is much more conducive to the creation of coherent longitudinal, literally soul, which is why among the ancient Druids, the, the grandparents and parents are present at the moment of uh, insemination on the wedding bed because their attention helps create that implosion, which ensouls long-term memory. Absolutely. And it's literally true that lack of orgasmic climax is related to eventual loss of ensoulment. Absolutely true. Because implosive compression is what connects the nodes of the array for the same reason that cesarean section, which prevents the implosive squeezing of the birth canal, eventually leads to the loss of long-term memory and loss of ensoulment. It is the physics of remothering. That's why we have to soon understand the physics of how we get a soul, or we're going to create a generation of Borgs. We got to figure this out quick. Thanks, Dan. We finished all the questions. Was that a happily ever after? Not sure. Definitely. I prefer happily ever afters myself, even when I'm watching Lassie episodes. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I hope you guys had fun. Uh, thank you for your questions. Sorry if I got carried away, but we wanted to tell the story of the history of Thoth and Hermes and the Caduceus. And I love the questions at the end. They were good. Thank you, Tufa. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks, everybody. Thank and you. We'll see you next week. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thank you. Blessings. Thank Thanks you. for being family. <laughs> Bye, Jenny. Thank Bye, you. Amy. Thank you. Bye, Jane. Thank you, much. Thank you so much. <laughs> we carried oh. on, but oh well. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.